you take the columns like the one he was uh, uh, describing, here is just uh, uh, half an earth. Uh, this is a complete one because the columns are being reversed. And you set up a float that does exactly the swirling motion, right? And you go through it uh, using that iterative technique I described uh, uh, the first day, where you iteratively solve for the induction at each order, all right? And what, once, you, once you do that, the, the good thing is you can relate that to a dynamo problem because at some stage the field that you get from the induction after n steps is going to be parallel to the field you started with. And once you have that, you find yourself a, neut uh, uh, a neutral mode so that uh, uh, after n steps of induction, the field at order bk plus n is parallel to the field at order k and now uh, uh, the coefficient behind, uh, in front of it is just the magnetic Reynolds number to the n times uh, the projection between those two things. So it gives you a critical magnetic Reynolds number for dynamo action. It's, it's a way in which, by looking at how induction processes, you can build both a neutral node all right, and uh, a critical threshold. It only works for stationary dynamo at uh, moderately uh, low uh, um, uh, uh, RM because you're, since you're solving this, you're still assuming that you have a quasi-static uh, uh, approximation. But in, 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 doing so, in doing so, you can see what processes look back in making your dynamo because at each step you impose a field, you see how it is distorted, then at the next step you see how that field gets distorted by the velocity field and so on, and that, and that, proves, uh, 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 that proves helpful. Uh, uh, well, uh, the only thing that I wanted, the, the reason why I put this slide up is that once, one, once you do that for the geometry that Chris was showing, if you put just columns going up and down like this, what you find out is you mainly have a, a quadrupole, a transverse dipole. You never really heat uh, 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 the axle dipole. And, and so I wanted a word of caution on what he was uh, describing. Sometimes you get the picture, you see that the dipole, there is an actual dipole that grow in some region of space. But whether the dipole is going to win over the quadrupole really depends on the fine details. So this helps you understand the basics. But now, what is dominant, <coughs> one has to look deep and what is really the recirculation. And in that case, uh, the little cartoon that I had is, is lacking for, from two major features. One of them is Ekman pumping, because uh, it is not tilted, and the other is the precise evolution of buoyancy with temperature. And so this doesn't exist here, and so that fails to reproduce the fact that in the actual problem, the dynamo would. All right, there's, there's just a comment on, on that as well. All right, I went over this yesterday. What I'm going to talk about today is uh, 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 the, the result of the VKS uh, uh, experiment. Um, um, can, can we, oh, I didn't press something. All right, uh, uh, so uh, it's by far not something that I've done on my own. Uh, actually, the least of people here is coded. So, uh, on the first line, you have the people that uh, did a PhD working on MHD processes and that sodium experiment. So, it's the one that actually did the work. And the rest of us is just goofing off someplace. And this is the engineers that actually make sure that you don't uh, blow yourself once you operate uh, uh, the machine. And uh, uh, I'll show you a little bit of so it's the people in, in, in Lyon, uh, in Saclay around uh, uh, François Davio, and in Paris around uh, Stéphane Fauve. I'll show you a few pictures of uh, what it looks like. Uh, you can see how silly we are, how we look when we are operating the machine. And the papers, the main paper is more sure, right, always? Well, this, we have a we have a rule is since we always have a few uh, uh, PhD students working on it, the papers are always signed as a as a PhD student being the first author, and we we rotate well to make. Mm -hmm. So it's it's never any of us at all. It's it's the students.
difference, mm -hmm. which is which is fair, <laughs> then, mm -hmm. basically. So, uh, well, just to prove myself uh, correct here, uh, the experiment is running today. So what's the right. field strength today? Huh? What's the field strength today? Uh, it was zip yesterday, zero. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, we're sort of, I'll describe what is it we do uh, uh, this week in, in a little while. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, so um, uh, the, the Cataract experiment is mainly, uh, it's, it's a whole machinery uh, uh, aimed at housing this. This is the cylinder I've been talking about for the past uh, uh, few days, and here is the impeller that when it rotates, uh, 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 move the sodium, there's still a little bit of sodium, that's the white thing here, because it, it, sodium is metallic, as you'll see, but you expose it to air and immediately is covered with uh, sodium hydroxide, which is white, okay, and burns like hell. Uh, 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 so, uh, this, this here is a copper, that's the vessel of the cylinder, all right? Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a copper uh, eight centimeters thick into which holes have been bored all along the axis of the cylinder, whereby we circulate fluid and we alternate the circulation around the cylinder because we do the cooling uh, there. And the rest of the whole setting here is just making sure that the sodium never sees any uh, uh, air or humidity. So you have sodium around the sodium is everything is shielded with argon and, and that's it. Please ask questions if you feel like. And, and, and uh, uh, then you have this entire unit where we control that everything, all, the, all these are indicators telling you that the temperatures, pressures, blah, 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 uh, do the job. Uh, none of it is uh, uh, controlled by uh, Windows. Uh, uh, Microsoft is completely out of this game. This is just pure old relays uh, with a coil and a magnet, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, 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 you don't have to reboot and do uh, uh, control L shift when things go bad, right? So <laughs> I, the re I'm saying this for a reason because now people tend to have more and more things that are controlled by a computer when in matters of safety you want things just as simple as you can. Uh, uh, for instance, this is, so what you're looking at here is one story four meters high above so that if anything goes wrong, the veins open and the sodium drops back into the tank, okay? And that, that thing is just as simple as it gets. It's a simple uh, magnetic activated uh, uh, loop. <laughs> There's no control of uh, any computer in it. And this is a little room where we cram all the computers for the measurements. There's a little bit more. So that's how it looks for the side compared to uh, pictures. This is not the loops that create the dynamo. <laughs> these, these are just for uh, uh, induction and excitation. You can see here, here is a shaft. The shaft is going in there and rotating the propeller about here. This is just the tubing for connecting the cooling that go back and forth uh, all around uh, 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 the cylinder, uh, plus the mess of wires. Uh, uh, that's on the right is the sodium. Uh, so sodium is just like it's a metal, right? So it looks like metal when it when it flows. That's what you have to shield. And these are you, you can see here. Uh, those are the in and out places where you, we put uh, probes inside the vessels, all right? So it, it, these are, uh, uh, through these holes, where we actually have plungers inside uh, with uh, probes and the proper cooling and all, and there's only a few places where we do that into the flow. Uh, this one is, uh, uh, is <coughs> each of these veins here, control where argon is flowing around the system. It's, uh, it's, it's step number one when you do the, the BKS PhD, you can learn how to use this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Usually it's, a, it, it's, it's the first week. All right. So uh, that's the, um, 
basically when you turn all, all this into a, a, a diagram, you got the cylinder here which is about 60 centimeters in every direction, then you have the propellers that rotate in opposite direction most of the time. Uh, uh, there's the, the, the outer vessel, which is, the tubes are in the wrong direction, but I wanted to emphasize that there's tubing here for cooling. We have a blanket of sodium, which is stationary. I'll talk about that uh, uh, again, because uh, uh, after all the um, uh, optimization that Riga people did, we thought it would be a good idea to copy uh, uh, a successful recipe. Um, what else? And so the mechanical power you input into uh, uh, the flow is 300 kilowatts. Uh, the torque that you have uh, that you input into the flow is comparable to a Formula One racing car. Uh, and it has, since we operate on one thousandth of the budget, uh, 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 we have the same pitfalls. That is, sometimes you prepare all the experiments and you run for as long as as short as 25 seconds is our record for uh, hitting the start button and shutting down everything <laughs> because there's a major problem and sometimes you can run for three weeks all right but you don't know in advance you, you just get prepared and uh, you have the same little problems that you have when you operate in this range and the last thing that I will discuss uh, at length during this lecture is, is the fact that uh, uh, the discs are made of soft iron. Soft iron are ferromagnetic materials and I will discuss this in great detail. Alright, so uh, seen from inside, uh, again, uh, 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 the, the experiment, you have the outer vessel, you have the inner wall which is shielding a little bit, creating a blanket of, of sodium outside which is not set into motion by the rotation of the impellers. You have the plungers here and basically uh, uh, you know that you can have one, two, three, four, five measurements. All right? uh, we've improved techniques which uh, I will only uh, have at a few points now. This is an array of ins or instead of being just the simple magnetic measurements. So these stars can be an array of magnetic measurements or just one measurement magnetic measurement at one point. Uh, for, the, for, well, for, for the moment, we have no velocity probe in there. This is what they're doing this week. We devise a new velocity probe. We're testing it. Yes? Yeah. Um, at, at, to, to what extent can the excessive turbulence produced inside be due to the, 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 the symmetry created by those small clusters? <coughs> They modify the flow greatly. Okay, they're about this big. They plunge inside. Uh, they create turbulence. What you have to to remind, remember, is the turbulence from the flow itself. If you remove all the plungers, all right, is already huge. The fluctuations are always of the order of the mean. Okay, you measure mean velocity v, and you try you compute v RMS. Okay? And the ratio of the two is basically one. Okay? So when you add the plungers, you don't change that ratio. It's already what it is. Okay? But you do modify things. The other thing is I'll show you what is robust. We, we have a few measurements where uh, none were present, but then you lose the diagnostics. <laughs> and with more or less present, and it doesn't really change uh, uh, the behavior. But it is a concern. Right. It, what does it mean for you? It's a time direction. Of, of you, the velocity? Yeah. Uh, we'll discuss that. Ah. No. It's, it's, uh, on the average, it's the usual, uh, uh, it's the same as what I've uh, been talking about uh, uh, all the time. It's those recirculating flow plus toroidal motion. I'll, I'll, I'll show expressions for that uh, uh, in, in a moment. But basically, that's the measurements we have. So again, uh, we, we, if, if I compare it to what we've just heard uh, 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 in, in the previous lecture, what, what we're trying to do here is really relate what we see to what's going on. Okay? It will be, uh, uh, since, we, it's, if, since it's a lab experiment, you expect to have access 
to what is really going on and you want to measure and relate what you see to mechanism. You want to relate what you see to the MHD dynamics that actually takes place. So I'll spend a lot of time describing uh, things as take it as a game to try to see what can you reconstruct from the measurements and there isn't that many measurements. Sorry, just one sorry. Yes. Um, just going back to that sure. previous slide, how crucial is the metal ring that's in the middle? Come back to it again. I will I will so so that slide that slide here is what happened in September 2006, all right? And we're basically three years later, and uh, what I'll describe now is taking what I've, what we've done for the past three years is take apart everything that I've introduced to you and see what this or that, what influence it has on the dynamo, okay? So I'll describe uh, with the ring, without the ring, with the inner cylinder, without the cylinder, with the ferromagnetic, without the ferromagnetic, rotating this, rotating that, <laughs> measuring here, measuring that, right? Okay, we're, we're, uh, uh, we have to understand, it's, it's a very bad measurement. All you have is, a as, as I said again, all you have is a stethoscope and you want to know how the baby is doing, right? And, and, and we have a few stethoscopes that we're moving around, and, but, but at least we have access to uh, a rich dynamo, all right, and hope to, um, to, to, to progress from a lab point of view uh, 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 to, to understand what's going on. Could I also ask, do you actually move the probes during the experiment, or do they, do they go in and stay, stay put? No, once it stays put for one run. Then in between runs, you can move them, but for one run, no, no. Uh, in the experiment, uh, um, So during that experiment, the whole thing is closed, all right? The thing makes more noise than uh, uh, an airplane. Uh, uh, um, and uh, you, can, you can barely talk. Uh, uh, you can't. I mean, we've actually learned a few elements of sign language to be able to communicate. <laughs> because even with the, uh, uh, the earplugs and the microphones, you don't really hear what's going on. That's it. It's a very good uh, noise generator. I should have, I have a few recordings. I'll see if I can do it tomorrow. It's, it's music very different from the one you played yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, um, and so basically what happens, so what I'm describing here is we're rotating the two impellers in the opposite direction at exactly the same frequency. Okay. So the picture uh, 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 you have in mind is this rotates in one direction, the opposite direction, you have the, the shearing, you have the recirculation loop, and that's the average velocity. And then, of course, I've told you that the actual instantaneous flow has much more uh, 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 fluctuations than this. And here is a measurement taken at a point here, and in the course of time, you're increasing the, the velocity of rotation of the motors, all right? And what you see is that the toroidal component measured here, the one in red, increases and, and saturates to A value while having huge fluctuations on top. Okay? Uh, uh, so this is, this is evidence of, this is the, the, the onset of the dynamo. There, the velocity was too small, you have uh, a no action. Then it is growing. Ideally, you would like to be able to uh, bump it to, uh, uh, from F1 to F2 instantaneously, but because of inertia and everything, you can't do that. So you increase the frequency of rotation slowly, and when you're above critical, you see a magnetic field like this. And again, I'll spend a lot of time convincing you that the, the topology of the field is the one of cartoons here, because it is relevant. Now, the one thing you want with the dynamo is that B and minus B can grow uh, uh, with equal probability. And this is indeed what happens when you stop everything. So what you do is you go below thre threshold, you run for a little while, you go above threshold again. And what happens is that same field that was negative measured at the same location that was negative here now is positive with the same characteristics. All right? 
you can you can grow a dynamo with a B or minus B uh, 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 field. And you see at the point where I measure, essentially you've increased the fluctuation in the axial and radial components. And most of the, fl of, of, of the magnetic field here is toroidal at the point uh, where I do the measurement. All right? <coughs> Now, you can look at just the average value, all right, and plot the evolution of the average value as a function of magnetic Reynolds number. And what you end up is those two curves uh, 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 that uh, uh, come from the points uh, 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 when the dynamo starts in one direction or the other. <coughs> there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a couple of features here. Don't trust the, the, the lines here are just for visual effects, all right? They don't they don't pretend to any scaling. We'll, we'll come back to it. They point to roughly the same threshold, Rn equal to about 32, and then uh, it increases uh, from there. And those are the toroidal uh, components. So, that one, oh, obviously, this soft iron. Has this hysteresis effect, right? So <coughs> it doesn't affect it, or what? So, uh, or you you demagnetize it before you start your experiment. Thank you. The <laughs> uh, first thing is that the soft, pure soft iron has uh, uh, coercitive, is how you say it in English? Oh, okay, something. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know what science is useful because. Uh, 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 All right, so that's, this is, what's, this is B and this is H, how do you call this point? You call it this point. <laughs> well, hence, uh, you know? The French are more precise than this. <laughs> <laughs> what's the French word then, again? It's, it's called the coercitive field. It's, it's, it's the field that you have to apply in order to uh, annihilate the magnetization once you've set the current equal to zero. It's the remnant, would that, would that do it? Remnant magnetization mm -hmm. of, soft, of pure soft iron is below one gauss. Okay? But thank you for the question anyway. Uh, uh, this is after demagnetizing, so this is the first magnetization curve and, and the reds are all the subsequent bifurcations. So in that diagram here, we've demagnetized and how do we demagnetize something I explained uh, in the next lecture? It's very easy because the field has reversals. So you can uh, do the demagnetization like you would do in the lab by having a cycle with reducing amplitudes. So that's the first uh, magnetization. And then all the subsequent are here. So in the sense, in, that's the first thing that is clear from the ferromagnetic impellers. It's making the bifurcation perfect. Okay, and for the reasons that you can understand, and from, uh, 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 you, you can see the weak induction here, okay? And then it's starting off the dynamo, so the bifurcation is imperfect. Now, the, the first result is, I don't know if you remember, but the, the disks have curved blades, all right? So it is not the same thing whether you rotate in the scooping direction or in the opposite direction. One of them is... Uh, uh, really scooping fluid and throwing it away from the blade, and the other is more gentle. All right? What it does in terms of mean flow, it is changing the ratio of poloidal to toroidal uh, 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 velocity. When you rotate in the non, I don't know how to call it, in the non scooping direction like this, the poloidal to toroidal ratio is about 1, and when you rotate like this, there's far more toroidal than poloidal, about half. Okay? Uh -oh. and, and so if you do this and you rotate in the opposite direction, the threshold that used to be here now is a little bit further in error. Okay? It's, it's a, that, that threshold depends on the polydoctoroidal ratio. One issue which is very interesting uh, uh, but uh, at the present not resolved in the experiment is what is the scaling? Uh, I've shown you that's the average field you measure at some point as a function of magnetic Reynolds number, right? If it is an ordinary 
uh, 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 supercritical bifurcation, and you've seen that we start from zero field and build the field, so it is a supercritical bifurcation. But if it is an ordinary supercritical bifurcation, like you have in, 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 in many models, uh, then the field has to increase like square root of Rn minus Rn critical, right? So you, you plot B squared as a function of Rm and, uh, uh, well, if you want a straight line. Um, well, I can't do it here. But it, it, it may look like a straight line if you want. Uh, 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 but then the fluctuations also look like a straight line. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the one here as a function of Rm. And at the moment, there is no precise uh, uh, value of this. The best fit I was showing to you in, in a plot like this, if, if I do a, a fitting of the exponent in that curve here, I find Rm to the power of 0.71 rather than 0.5. Okay? So, <coughs> it's a, it's, 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 this question is not uh, 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 just trying to fine peek the small details on, uh, on, on, on the dynamo. It's, in physics, it's a very open question to see whether the bifurcations in the presence of noise will have the same scaling as ordinary bifurcation from low dimensional theory. All right? There is no uh, uh, known uh, theory for, and, and there is noise. I mean, there's huge amount of noise here. So you expect that the noise, which is in all the terms in the in the equation, for instance, in the induction equation, the driving term, which is curl u cross b, is is a turbulent u, right? So you expect that if you go to any low dimensional model, your quantities will be fluctuating. If they do, I don't know of any theory that says when you add noise to an ordinary bifurcation then the scalings have to be such and such. All right? And, and it's, a, it's a modern problem in, in, in uh, uh, nonlinear physics that's really worth it, but it hasn't been resolved in, in that case. That's for, um, that slide is for Axel. It's the question you asked me the first day. So when you go next to the threshold, what you find is that the level of fluctuation compared to the mean field to the mean value increase and then saturate. And that's the best evidence we have for proximity to thresholds. Uh, uh, although, when you see that little increase here, it's pretty hard to guess that the threshold is there. I still don't know. And, and then you ask about the decay rate. And here is one realization of magnetic field being switched off. That's the red line. And uh, uh, if you low pass, that's the red line, okay? And uh, if you average them all, that's the underlying red line, which is not changing so much with the proximity to RMC. So as I said, this part is still. So what is shown on this graph? The one here? Yes, BRMS somehow. Oh, it's, 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 the vertical axis, it must be one, which is two, uh, right? It's no, it's, it's yeah. And or you're, uh, you're paying attention. It's, it's my labeling of the, the y-axis, which is bad. Let me explain what we've got. Mm -hmm. I know. That's nice to spot it. Well, what I'm plotting in here is, at a point here, I look at the fluctuating value here, which is b minus b mean squared. Mm -hmm. OK? And that b squared, uh, and I divide that by the mean value. Okay, that's that's what I'm showing, and you see there's far more fluctuations here than there were fluctuations there, and and if you if you do this consistently, and it's it's my it's my label here, which you were quick to uh, uh, spot, which is not correct. It's fluctuation divided by me, and the level of fluctuations seem to increase. And the ratio is four, right? Yeah, the onset. Then yeah, the yeah. Um, is there a parallel, perhaps, um, in no. the... In <laughs> no, I mean, with respect to the difference. So if you plot uh, Rm minus Rm peak, it could be like uh, minus one power, for example, as you often have for blow-up phenomena. Yeah. You don't think you have that? I'm not sure. I mean, what is the curve? You have a red curve that suggests it for 
having no, some therapy is a night light. It's, mm -hmm. it's a, 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 a. So what happens? So you send it to infinity, right? What, what, yeah, yeah. What, like what we do with the one over one right. Rn minus Rn curve, Rn curve minus Rn. Let me describe why I'm not so proud of this curve. The, the reason is, when I do all these variations that you guys suggested, remove this, remove that, remove that, I still had more or less a, a behavior like this, but then the red curve is different every time. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not approaching the threshold in the same manner every time, how do I predict it? Okay, what would be useful is to be able to predict it. To, up to now we can't. But then again, it's related to the previous point. It's related to the fact that we have no global theory for uh, 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 exponents in, in, in a phase transition with noise. This is, this is the same thing again, it's the same plot, uh, 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 Anwar, is, is when you way below threshold, this is a histogram of the fluctuations and they build up uh, uh, when you're... Uh, uh, um, the, the interesting thing to note here is that once you, you build uh, the fluctuations, you all, 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 always have uh, a part which is in the opposite direction. That is, you always have little fluctuations in your dynamo where the, field, the, the, the sign of the field is, is locally changed. Which, which is not the same thing as going to a reversal when the sign when the sign of the field is globally reversed, right? Here it's locally, uh, you can have fluctuations that drop. Uh, uh, yeah, just means that the fluctuations are stronger than the mean. Absolutely. It's, it's a characteristic of these dynamos, the fluctuations are stronger than the mean, and, and possibly with some exponent. But it was open 25 only in the previous plot. It was then it grew to 0.3. No, okay, but you only saw 0 0.25. 0 0.25 what? If, if the previous, maybe, the one well, that's, with that's, the red line. That's the ratio to meet to, to width, uh -huh. is 0.25. Is, is a All right, another question that is, that is interesting, because at least it has been solved in the two previous Dynamo experiments, the one in Riga and Karlsruhe, is how much magnetic field do you get out of it? Okay, it's a, it's a, 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 a <coughs> Chris made a point uh, that it could be extracted from the earth and different things. The, the question is, uh, 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 how much field is buying you uh, of the dynamo? All right, and and there's uh, there's a few. If if you're absolutely naive, and we've been that, in order to stop. Uh, yes, no. What do I need to do at home? <laughs> the best one is the overhead. Overhead. Okay. Overhead. Um, if, you're, if you're completely naive uh, uh, in trying to figure out what is the magnetic field of saturation, you say that the Lorentz force has to heat someone, right? In the, in the uh, 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 Navier Stokes equation. Right? So, you could, you could pick two simple choice. Once it is heating on the viscous terms, all right, and then you, you say you, you're going to balance uh, a viscous uh, uh, to be on the order of Lorentz. If you do this, you'll end up with something like viscosity uh, to be on the order of Lorentz force. Lorentz force is J cross B. J is mainly uh, uh, sigma u cross b cross b, okay? And if you do that, you end up with rho nu uh, nu u velocity the length uh, to be equal to nu u b squared. So you do this and you find out that B squared has to grow like uh, uh, the U drop out, rho nu over sigma. Uh, uh, you need a length, take the radius of the apparatus for lack of anything better, and then it grows like Rn to minus Rnc because you're assuming you have a starting thing. Okay, that's, that's the way of saying 
uh, that the uh, uh, tolerance force is going to uh, uh, affect. Viscosity, viscosity meaning the mean profile, all right? And, <clears throat> and this is basically what was found in Riga and Karlsruhe, where uh, 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 the pressure drop, the profile changed into, in Karlsruhe, mainly uh, the fluid got with a different Hartmann profile and slower uh, uh, in the main, you know, Charles through as these generators there. And what they found is that the, the fluid goes from here to a profile which is a little more like this and goes a little slower. All right? And that change in the profile is what's keeping the dynamo near criticality uh, at, at onset. And in Riga, it's the slowing down of the azimuthal velocity uh, uh, mainly that uh, reduces the velocity. Uh, 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 all right? Then you can. Then you can do uh, then you can do the uh, uh, the opposite image. You can say that Lorentz force is going to be uh, uh, balanced by inertial forces. In which case it is rho u grad u that will come in balance to uh, this. And once you've done that, uh, there's a u that drops, so you'll be like rho u over l, well, let's we do r again, uh, to be of the order of sigma v squared. So you find that v squared has to go like rho over sigma r uh, u and now you do two things to that u uh, the u here is just the u you needed to be critical all right it's it's the velocity you, you had to push into the flow to be in your onset so it's the one that says uh, uh, um, mu sigma r u equal to something your threshold all right so that this behaves uh, uh, like rho over u is mu sigma squared r and again that's how much of a change you expect from a supercritical bifurcation all right this is i mean if, if people are in the business of scaling laws the, those are the two extreme ones that you can that you can drive by hand and so you plot one or the other as a function of the uh, magnetic Reynolds number and you try to describe to, to you try to uh, decide which is the one you 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 think is the best straight line <laughs> right and if you, if you ask me the one on the top uh, uh, is the best straight line but then again the prefactor is always a hundred and it is a hundred it's high and when you do when you do dimensional analysis you like the prefactor to be one in the end mm -hmm. you don't want to tune the value so if you decide I want to tune the value 0.4 is closer than one but then again it's not as a nice straight line what it shows you is that of course that argument is way too crude all right if, if the flow is hit if the magnetic field is sitting on the turbulence which is what I've written here of course, tur change turbulence will, will change uh, the Reynolds stress, and the Reynolds stress change the mean profile. Actually, you can go from this scaling to the one I've written before by writing a turbulent viscosity. Okay? If I take the Vaminar scaling I had before, and I write turbulent viscosity, I end up with that scaling, right? And, and in that case, is both effects have to be taken into account. All right? But as, as a first approximation, that's what it buys you. So, uh, if you want to compare uh, uh, different experiments in terms of, so the ratio of these things here, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is, is sometimes called the Lundquist number. I'm getting lost in MHD with so many numbers. You take two dimensional numbers, you divide one by the other, you have a new number. Lundquist is Alvin's speed or BRMS over new, uh, Ida. Is that what you have? I think, I think this one here, if I divide b squared by that, which is what I have here, so I think it's called the Lundquist number. Or at least, we'll, 
That's what we wrote down. If you if you write what? If I if I divide b squared by that thing here. I don't see where you're pointing. Where do you point? On the board. Yes, and then. If if b squared has to scale like this, then the ratio of this to this is a dimensionless number. So b yes. squared mu yeah. sigma squared r yes. divided by rho. Right. That, and that, that's Lundquist number for Lundquist you? Lundquist number squared, right? Lundquist and number squared. I'm, 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 I'm the one that can't remember those numbers yeah. in more than five minutes. Uh, uh, <coughs> so, so when you do this, uh, that's how the different experiments compare where we have, I think it is Karlsruhe in green, uh, uh, Riga in red. Uh, has, Riga has very good scaling in Lundquist as a function of R and, and And the blue points are... Uh, data. So, uh, um, you can make, what I'm trying to say is that you can make a reasonable argument in trying to find out how much field you bring from these uh, dynamics. Now, <coughs> and another point uh, concerns uh, the spectra. What I've plotted here is, is the recording of the magnetic field at one point in space Okay, which is Fourier transform, and this is the Fourier transform in time of that. It, it's, it's, it's important to remember because people look for scaling exponent in k space. All right? In between k space and Fourier space, people usually invoke what is called the Taylor hypothesis, saying that the turbulence is frozen, it is swept past your probe, okay? uh, so that x in space is u mean u times t, but with such a fluctuating u, all right, and in the case of a dynamo, this is not at all uh, a guarantee. Okay? And what we see for the different uh, uh, flows is that, uh, <coughs> so the, those are the spectra in the dynamo regime uh, when you increase uh, uh, the, 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 the radius of the measurements. So you go from a measurement that is made near the center to measurement that is made outside of the volume, all right? And if you see spectra like this, the main lesson from all this is that it hasn't changed much when compared to the non-dynamo induction case, okay? So if I put on top a spectrum that is before, uh, if I impose a field and I build a spectrum of magnetic field fluctuations, and if I uh, uh, grow a dynamo and put the spectrum of magnetic fluctuations, I don't see much of a difference. Of course, I expect a difference because the turbulence has to be uh, 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 changed and you see the numerics and all this, it means that I'm not resolved well enough at that stage. And, and, I'll, uh, and that's the kind of spectrum you build uh, uh, when at a given location you increase the magnetic Reynolds number. Okay. And what's the black line? And the line here is minus 5 thirds. What did we plot minus 5 thirds? Oh yeah, we plot minus 5 thirds because Karlsruhe plotted minus 5 thirds. Uh, 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 and, and you can make, so, but I, I won't do it because I won't believe it, but you can make a hand waving argument for minus 5 thirds. And here is minus 11 thirds if you want to believe minus 11 thirds. But in the end, it's way steeper than this. Actually, the cutoff in, that, in our case is more exponential than anything else. And, uh, and uh, maybe here is one that Anamar will enjoy if you can give me the explanation. Mm -hmm. If this one here is, this one's pretty clear, and it turns out to be minus one. That's so it's, the radio, right? yeah, it's the, the one component where we could build a case for a minus one. Uh, of the spectrum, you think. Okay, now the neutral mode. All right. So if you start a dynamo, I've told you something about where it starts. Uh, I've told you something about what value it has. Now we go, what is the shape of the dynamo? Now remember, I want the shape of the neutral mode, I only have a few probes, right? So I need to convince myself and hopefully convince you of our conclusions. All right. So, what, what we had is, let me go back to the few plungers that go in there, and that's what they're, I should have copied the few. Right. 
what I'll, what I'll describe here is by running an array of 3D magnetic probes in a line which is closer to one disk, in the middle here, in the middle there, and that's all. Okay? That's, that's basically what I'm using. And I'm using the value of these fields and eventually the correlation between these values uh, uh, to uh, draw a picture of what's going on. Now, when I put the measurement right in the mid plane here, and I look at how the field varies as a function of depth and direction, I get this, this is symmetrized. Okay? So, so the bottom part of it is just me flipping the upper part. Right? The measurement says it, it has that geometry here, and it says it goes inward near the disk. Okay? And on the other side, we have just one location, it's in the same direction. The profile at the two different points is that near the axis, you get lots of actual fields. As you move away, you get a maximum of toroidal fields. All right? So this is, this is already pointing out a little bit in uh, 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 indicating that it is an actual dipole. The other, the other thing is that if you make a measurement here and a 90 degree here, they are absolutely correlated in that time, time variation. Okay? Which tells you that the magnetic field that we see is a large scale beast and it is correlated here and here. It has the same direction always. All right? So I sort of, uh, uh, I'm, uh, this comforts me into uh, uh, saying that if the field here is correlated to here and I now have that uh, symmetry, maybe I can uh, uh, finish the cycle and say I'm seeing a dipole field. All right? That's, that's what I mean when I say we grow a dipole. Why am I making such a big case of it? Is because the dipole, which started in the VKS experiment, is not at all what is expected from any simulations or studies we've done before. So I'm tracking back, all right? So the observation is we're growing a n equals zero dipole parallel to the axis. Okay, I need to explain that. Now, I'm tracking back and, uh, uh, to where we started uh, 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 people where people started uh, 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 in 89. This is a famous paper by Dudley and James uh, where he's, they're studying the kinematic dynamo in a sphere with flows that have these kind of string lines. So here it has uh, uh, poloidal loops and toroidal opposites in each hemisphere and that's in, in, in the language of Dudley and James that's called an S2T2 so toroidal two modes uh, uh, and poloidal two modes this would be uh, uh, an S2T1 and that would be an S1T1 alright it's, it's these kind of measurements say well uh, uh, it's this type of thing that started and say look if you look at the kin uh, kinematic dynamo and you increase the strength of this flow, here is the S2T2 here for you, at a magnetic Reynolds number of about 40, it self-generates. And this is what, this is basically what started the experimental community, because a flow like this, you have a chance to be able to reproduce. You say, all right, if that works, uh, I have, there's no complete theory, it's not like Reagan culture, you cannot write down a complete theory, but the simulation uh, said that. And of course, then you had two schools of thoughts, one of them with the people in Maryland, uh, uh, around Dan Lathrop and Cary Forest in Wisconsin that actually build spheres because uh, 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 they're more hardworking than we are, and, 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 and the lazy French thought they could do away with the cylinder by doing the same thing. You know, you say, put it in the cylinder, uh, rotate a little something, each of these propellers is going to do that, and then have the differential rotation, that's not so far away, why don't we do it? Okay. And next, a big improvement was a computation by Caroline Nord during her PhD and Marc-Étienne Brachet that actually uh, 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 solved uh, a flow 
which is, I've talked about the tail of green flow, it's not so unlike that picture. And once you've done, they've done a DNS of that, and they showed that if you run a DNS of that, of course, a magnetic parental number equals one itself generates. And that's important because, as has been pointed out many times, the kinematic dynamo problem is, is not the real problem. In reality, U and B uh, are evolved uh, uh, together. So dynamo means you're going from U1 B equals zero to U2 B non-zero. You don't, you don't go from U1 B equals zero to U1 B equals zero, uh, B non-zero. Uh, you, you have both fields have to be evolved. But at least it was very uh, uh, nice to see that uh, this grows. Now, when you do these simulations, either the computations by W. James for the kinematic problem or, uh, uh, or the computations by uh, Carolino and Marquetienne Brachet, uh, uh, you find that the dynamo mode. Uh, all right. <sighs> The dynamo mode that grows is m equal 1. I'm sorry, I should have. Uh, so here the propellers are on, on these two ends of the cylinder. And the mode that is grown has that twisted uh, uh, shape like this uh, uh, with uh, a main component m equal 1. All right? And we, we, we spent years, I've, I'm not going to detail that, we spent years trying to figure out what all the modifications you do to the flow change that mode. How do you change the critical magnetic Reynolds number? How do you change the shape of the mode? For example, following Riga, if you put a layer of sodium at rest, you change the shape of the neutral mode from here to here. It still has the twisted shape and the, and the, and the perpendicular uh, uh, dipole, uh, but it has, this one has a threshold uh, uh, in the computation which is 25% lower than this one. Remember, I'm still bringing the threshold into what I can see. I don't crank uh, the numbers until I hit the instability. And then there's the observation by Kerry Forrest in Wisconsin that when he's running his experiment uh, 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 here with the propellers that are a little bit different in the sphere, what he's observed in 2006 was that you get intermittent burst of n equal one activity. Okay? Whether there was the proximity to an onset, anything like an on-off bifurcation or anything, I don't know. I know neither does he actually. But the, 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 the evidence was clear from a reconstruction of the magnetic fields on a wide area because Kerry has uh, these probes located at the ghost co-locations around the sphere. So you can reconstruct the mode. All right? it is clear that the m equal 1 has intermittent ex excitations. All right? So, so uh, 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 all this says uh, uh, it's, a, it's a big uh, um, challenge to understand why it is m equal 0. First, it does not compare with the simulation. And then it does the second thing. If the n equals zero mode is the one that is growing, okay, uh, it cannot be generated by the mean flow. I cannot invoke the structure I've drawn here. I cannot invoke it because that structure is axisymmetric, and I'm not generating an axisymmetric dynamo from an axisymmetric flow field. Okay, that's why we say this. Huh? It is not current theory. It must be an auto theory. Because it is not forbidden to have a dynamo from an axisymmetric flow field. Guide this dynamo, for example. I know that this argument is often used, but uh, I, I, I see no justification for this. So Think of the, the original guide this dynamo. You have an axisymmetric flow field. And you so what is Kelly's theorem then? Magnetic uh, field is axisymmetric. Theorem is a statement about the symmetry of the magnetic field alone. Okay. Not not of the. Right. Of so the so if I'm assuming that the magnetic field is axisymmetric at onset, n equals zero. Yeah. So can I grow it from an axisymmetric flow? You can never grow it. 
Yes. Of course. Yes, this will be the back on it. Okay, so that's what I meant. I'm sorry for the bad thing. Sorry. What, what I meant is, uh, uh, the f if I'm assuming that I'm growing an n equal zero dipole at onset, then I cannot grow it from the mean flow. Right? Is, is that okay? Yeah. All right. So, uh, uh, so at some point I have to not use that in whatever um, invoking for. I have to use fluctuations. Then, the last thing I have to uh, explain is that I am not able to grow dynamo without ferromagnetic impellers. Okay? That is, uh, 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 if I replace, I'm doing exactly the same thing. If I'm replacing those ferromagnetic impellers by stainless steel impellers, I don't see a dynamo. I see a growth of field, which is, again, different from what can be predicted, oh, I'm sorry, but I can't switch it on. Uh, it's broke. Uh, 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 I, I get the squares here is what I measured. As, as, so I don't go a dynamo, so I do induction, right? It's the only thing you can do when you don't have a dynamo. And the induction says I can induce lots of fields, a lot more than what I apply. Look, one is here. And, but that field is different from the one I predict numerically from the mean flow. So I already know that the, the, the average B is not the same as the induction from the average V. All right? Okay, so I know fluctuations have to be taken into account. But I do not grow a dynamo uh, 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 without the ferro uh, in color. So I need to explain that. Okay? That's, uh, that's what we spent the, the past uh, three years doing among other things. So uh, that slide is up for, uh, I'll show it again, but this one is for Agris. Uh, here is what we've tried since then. So this is the dynamo driven by stainless steel and stainless steel, uh, iron and stainless steel, iron and iron, that's with the inner ring, uh, the inner cylinder. Uh, um, so if I draw it again, the first one I showed you, I have I had a, an inner cylinder here shielding for a, for a layer of sodium at rest, and I have a ring. Okay. So the first one is with the inner cylinder and the ring. This is uh, with the inner cylinder. I've removed the ring, and the last one is I've removed the inner cylinder. I don't have sodium at rest. Okay. In all cases, I get the dynamo when I use iron. Okay, with, uh, uh, with that's the critical frequency for onset. Uh, uh, it turned out to be 17. I removed the ring, does nothing on the threshold, it's still 17. And I uh, uh, remove the inner cylinder, it drops. Now, the VKS team is about 12 people, so every time we have, uh, we have bets before we start something. And, and, uh, 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 than the one who loses the bet buys the dinner. Uh, so uh, in that case, uh, there's uh, so there's 12 of us, and there's 12 of us that predicted that when you remove uh, the inner cylinder, you increase the frequency. Okay. So since everyone lost, uh, we each paid our share. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And and B and C, uh, uh, B and C D is stuff that I will discuss uh, 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 later. Uh, the, the one information I want to remember than this is if I rotate just one propeller made of soft iron, I generate a dynamo. If I rotate just one propeller made out of stainless steel, I don't generate a dynamo. Okay? So I need to explain that. Alright. <coughs> now, Let's go back to n equals zero. n equals zero, if you're growing the dipole, then you're immediately thinking of an alpha omega dynamo. All right? Omega, the fluid is loaded with differential rotation. Alpha, uh, 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 pick your guess. Um, all right, the fluid is expelled uh, by the blades. 
and it swirls. That probably makes a, 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 a contribution which is very close to the drawing that you've shown us uh, for a galactic disk. You could have small scale contributions. I remember I've shown you that in the, in the measurements in PERM, there's evidence for a small scale contribution. It is much smaller than what we expected, but it is there. And then, of course, near the axis, the flow is going down and spiraling, so you have the Parker twist motion, all right, that can make an alpha effect. So uh, the, 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 the older zero assumption is that we, we have an alpha omega dynamo. Uh, so far, there's nothing that have had us change our mind about that. We still think it's an alpha omega dynamo, but not to the young. All right. <coughs> Now, the first attempt at explaining this comes from a work done by uh, uh, Laguerre and collaborators being uh, Caroline Nord, uh, Jacques Léorard, uh, Franck Prignan. Uh, um, what they did is try to believe what's going on. All right? So, you invoke an alpha in the induction equation. All right? You take for the velocity the velocity that is measured for this flow uh, in, in a water experiment, okay? uh, um, and you implement a kinematic calculation with an alpha. So uh, uh, the view of, of Carlino and collaborators was that alpha had to be localized near the impellers, so they located two bands where that alpha is active uh, near the impellers. So you do this, you crank the numerical simulation, and what you end up with is that you indeed self-generate, so you promote, this is the magnitude of alpha, and this is the critical magnetic Reynolds number. These correspond to uh, uh, ferromagnetic boundary conditions and then insulating boundary conditions. Here, in that case, ferromagnetism is only saying that B has to be attached perpendicular to the boundary. So there is, in, in the computation by, uh, in this computation, there is no rotating ferromagnetic disk. It's only numerically implemented that the field has to be attached perpendicular to the top and bottom layer. Okay? This is what is called ferromagnetic in, in, in that case. Uh, and and, and uh, it's, it's often the case in some astrophysical uh, uh, simulations I've seen that, 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 that be it's called ferromagnetic when it has to be perpendicular. Uh, uh, so in that particular version of ferromagnetism, what you find is that the first branch you hit uh, uh, for uh, several values of alpha is for the m equals zero dipole, okay, when alpha is present. Okay, so at least it says when you do this, uh, you can grow an m equals zero. It's not unexpected, but it's good to see. The, 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 the problem is that alpha is way too large. The alpha you need in that simulation to reach self-generation, al remember alpha is a velocity, okay? The alpha you need is the tip velocity of the blade. That's the fastest velocity there's in the problem, okay? It's, it's orders of magnitude too large. Uh, Why was it not symmetric about zero? Hmm? Why was the curve not about symmetric about zero? I mean, or at least, uh, I mean, the red and left blue lines, they cross the zero line. Yes, this, it's an observation that has also been made. I'll, I'll, there's another observation of that, that you can find dynamo action for alpha positive. Yes. Well, normally you would expect alpha to be negative. In, in, in that sense, when you, when you play the blue games, you expect alpha to be mainly negative. But in the equations, when you do put the positive alpha, it also gives a dynamo. Uh -huh. so this actually, I don't know why. Mm -hmm. So actually, but for a finite alpha, you find it becomes hard to excite any dynamo. But you, mean, certain, you, you want right? to pursue that line? No, no, if you go towards where the lines go up, shoot upwards. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You can, alpha, in these models, mm -hmm. alpha cannot be small. Mm. Alpha has to be over order one, and that's why when you do the scaling correctly. This is why, if, mm. if, you, if you look at that paper, you, you got to be careful of downloading the paper and the correction they've mm. published. 
Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Because in the first in the first uh, in the first PRL paper, they end up with a small alpha. Okay, but they made a mistake in the rescaling between uh, uh, non-dimensional computer units and gauss uh, meters per second real units. So there's a correction. There's an erratum. Uh, to that paper that gives you the correct tune. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in these things, alpha has to be, is, is too large. Now, what is true for, uh, here is a comment on that particular boundary conditions that says that the magnetic field has to be attached perpendicular to the uh, top and bottom plates. Even for the usual n equal 1 mode, if you, that's the, M, the usual n equal 1 mode, if you have those ferromagnetic boundary condition, the threshold is shifted to a lower value, all right? And it's the thinking along these lines uh, 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 that, in the beginning, had us put those ferromagnetic uh, impellers. Say, all right, is that going to decrease the threshold? But even for the M equal 1, it does that. Now, you can do a second attempt at uh, uh, getting that alpha omega uh, uh, dynamo working. One of them is you put alpha by hand. Equivalently, instead of putting alpha by hand, you put the vortices by hand. <laughs> it's, instead of saying that uh, uh, near the impellers you produce an alpha effect by setting alpha equal to something in the equation, you put those radial vortices. Okay? And then everyone will believe that if you cross a set of radial vortices like this, you can generate an alpha effect just as you do in the Earth, in Karlsruhe, or in places like that. So that has been done by uh, Christophe Guissinger. You take uh, this flow is a reasonable model of, of the mean flow uh, uh, in the cylinder. Uh, you add the perturbation here, uh, uh, which is uh, just that vorticity. This is just radial vorticity near the disk. And sure enough, if you do that, you find that you promote, again, an axial dipole. All right? So in any case, when you start adding some alpha, either you do it kinematically by imposing the swirls, or you do it numerically by adding one term to the induction equation, calling that alpha. In any case, you switch from uh, uh, an m equal 0 preferred mode to, uh, uh, sorry, an m equal 1 preferred mode to an m equal 0 preferred mode. But then again, that simulation has the same flaw as the previous one. You have to put a velocity which is way too large. You have to assume that the perturbation you've added on the flow, you have to assume that those swirl here, those eight swirls that correspond to the blades, have exactly the same velocity as the tip velocity of the flow. All right? It's a huge velocity. And, and, and that, that is not... Uh, believed to be correct. So, um, uh, uh, the thing is, uh, the, the question we've addressed experimentally, so, here, I, the way I've tried to get M equals zero from, from, uh, from the uh, uh, experiment is saying that I need some kind of alpha. All right, uh, uh, and that was in attempts where the boundary condition, okay, the ferromagnetic impellers, is thought of as a modification of the boundary condition. Okay. Now we ask experimentally the question: Is that true? Is when you add a ferromagnetic disk and a moving one, is all you do changing the way the magnetic field lines get attached to this thing? Okay. So we've investigated that experimentally. Uh, 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 in the gallium flow by doing induction measurements and we've had those impellers uh, broken into uh, disc and blades made of stainless steel, copper and soft iron and, and studied all the three choices of them okay, stainless steel plus copper, copper plus soft iron, soft iron plus copper and blah blah and all these nine possibilities, you can see six possibilities you, you can have uh, 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 of this and every time we study the magnetic response, the induction effects, and see what it changes. And, and the major surprise is that, so what I'm describing here is, and, oh gosh, it doesn't show so nicely.
I'm applying a magnetic field transverse to the rotation. I'm having both rotating in opposite direction, okay? And I'm measuring the field which is induced at several locations here. If you remember what I said the first time, that field is due because the, the rotation induces at each point, creates an induced magnetic field, and that induced magnetic field has to loop back inside the volume, which is called the boundary effect last time. Is, is again, it is, you have an applied field, you have a moving piece and a shear. The Hertzenberg calculations say that it induces a dipole which is perpendicular to it. So the field here rotates in this direction, will create a dipole like this. Rotates in the opposite direction, will create a dipole like this. And I have to loop it back. Okay? Because of the currents staying in the finite volume. And that's what I'm measuring here. So when you do this, you find that the profile of the induction, that is, the shape of the induced field as a function of radial distance does not change when you change uh, the impellers from stainless steel to iron to copper. But the magnitude gets a big change. That is, I get an induced field which is five times more when I put ferromagnetic impellers than when I use uh, a stainless steel or copper. All right? Make a long story short, the paper will still uh, will uh, uh, soon be published in a new journal of physics. It turns out that you can model all this by saying that the induced field is the usual one, which is due to the normal shear, plus what is locally happening on the disk. Okay? And the thing that is locally happening on the disk is, is, uh, is, uh, is a very important term. It drops to zero when the, conduct the, the diffusivities are equal. So it's an added term. It is not just changing the boundary condition. It's adding one component of induction. Okay? So that is goes to zero if I go to stainless steel. And then it's proportional to uh, the volume of the things that are moving. And if you do this, and if you plot on the same line, uh, uh, the change that you get going from stainless steel, stainless steel, stainless steel to iron, iron, stainless steel, iron, iron, you can feel the straight line that pretty much describes that. So you, you are adding one effect. So this, the, the experimental finding is putting soft iron had some mechanism that was not present when the soft iron wasn't there. All right, and I'll I'll come back to it now. The simulation that were done uh, uh, the past year by uh, the group of Frank Stefani and Rutte Gerbet in uh, Dresden uh, uh, implemented this in a numerical simulation. So again, it's a kinematic approach, but it, it's a lot of work that actually models with uh, uh, um, um, the impellers made of uh, magnetic material. So that has mu relative not equal to one, okay? And this is being rotated into the fluid, okay? And you fix the, the velocity field, you put exactly that, you solve, uh, uh, um, so you evolve the mean flow, you put an alpha term, okay, which you may want to switch off, but you put an alpha term, and you have those uh, rotating things. And what you find is that, uh, Still, if this, um, if alpha is zero, okay, the, then you cannot grow a, a, a dipole. That is, again, once again, the boundary condition is not enough to grow a dipole. But the boundary condition plus the magnetic, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the boundary condition, field lines attached like this plus the moving magnetic field says that the alpha you need to grow a dipole is reduced by a factor 100. Therefore, the magnetic permittivity that you have, mu relative is of the order of 100. And, and that gets you, you see you get alpha here, you cross, I, actually don't ask me questions, I can't answer, is the fact, how does it work for alpha positive, neg uh, positive uh, negative, negative, ah. 
Andre is calling positive, what is negative? All right, so what's happening on that side, I don't know. I'm only discussing this side, right? Mm -hmm. I, alpha negative, I know. Alpha positive, I don't have a good understanding of it. But for when mu is of the order of 40, that's the black line, you see that you cross a threshold for a very small value of alpha. And when you work out to dimensional units, what they did in Dresden, okay, you end up with an alpha value which is of the order of 40 centi uh, 10, 15 centimeters per second. Now, if you remember what I said about the perm experiment and the scaling from gallium to sodium, this is precisely what was measured. Okay? So, an alpha, and I don't know the origin, you, uh, Caroline, you tell me which is the right term. But I know that I've measured experimentally a term that has exactly the right alpha magnitude in these experiments. And when you do the simulation, you do, need, you do not need more than what I've measured for in order to self-generate. So I don't know which is the right alpha which is making the fluctuations. I don't think it is the swirls from the blades, because that would be too big a velocity. If it is the inhomogeneity of turbulence, the small, small scale ADCT or whatever, that, that I cannot say for sure. But I know that it is present and it can be invoked in the experiment. Okay, this is, this is a very uh, important conclusion. So let me finish by describing you what I believe to be the dynamo uh, a cycle in uh, the Kalarash experiment. Start with a magnetic field which is perpendicular to one disk. Then, the effect that I described of the ferromagnetic impellers, that factor of 100 uh, uh, in the, in, in the uh, increase of the induction, is the, loca the location next to the surface of the disk of an omega effect. So the omega effect that I have here is the shear at the disk. Okay, and this is consistent with calculation, this is consistent with the numerical simulation, this is consistent with experiments. Uh, uh, uh. The, the, um, now, so that shear is producing by differential rotation very easy, easily a toroidal field line out of a poloidal one, right? Now, that poloidal field line here is in a strongly diverging flow. Okay? Therefore, it can be augmented okay, by any value. And then, the disk itself is not axisymmetric, all right? because you have the blades on the veins. So it doesn't have to be augmented axisymmetrically. All right? Then, I don't know what happens to a line like this, but I know that I have an alpha effect which is consistent with the measurements. All I need is an alpha effect of the order of less than a meters per second. Okay? And if I do this, I produce the magnetic field which is parallel to the one starting. So the ferromagnetic discs do two things. They promote the m equals zero mode okay, by being there. They do stabilize it all right, by creating induction effects that would not be there uh, uh, with stainless steel disc. So. Uh, uh, the modes contrary to uh, 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 what we've, uh, uh, I don't think we've written it, but I, I'm sure we've said it. Uh, contrary to what I believed two years ago, the mode that we see is not the mode that would happen with stainless steel disc rotating faster. I don't know. I have no evidence of that. What I have evidence of is that n equals zero is strongly promoted by the ferromagnetic disc. So it is not just a boundary condition. It is promoting this mode and it is not the one that is predicted by numerical simulation for the R equal one. Okay? I think I will stop here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Jean Francois, for presenting us this is very revolutionary experiment and result and interpretations. Questions, please. Is the magnetic susceptibility of firing higher than the one with the fluid field? Oh, yes. What do you mean, mu r? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a it's hundred times that of the fluid. 
from the boundary condition. I think they do more. I think they localize an omega effect near them. And the fact that they localize an, eff an omega effect near them in a region where we know that alpha is likely, is strongly helping the dynamo. You still need alpha. There's no way that we know of that is going to get you rid of, of if I account for what I know now of this. Uh, and, and I think it's the combination of the fluctuations, the turbulent fluctuations, really, uh, more than the, the large-scale vortices. I think it's the turbulent fluctuation that couples to the shear that is induced by uh, 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 well, the omega effect, which is promoted by the ferromagnetic disk that does the dynamo. And that's why when you rotate just one, you get this. Then, of course, you don't have periodic boundary conditions or sliding periodic boundary conditions. So what happens with helicity then? Um, now you want the source of alpha. Oh, oh you are talking about magnetic uh -huh. yeah, But that's probably not important because these are, here they're my made of ground so it's low key and low R. Well, it's larger than one, right? Yeah, yeah, but it's small compared to when it becomes critical for catastrophic quenching. Those numbers are on the order of tens of fours. I have one more result for uh, a grace. Yeah. So what was running today? No, not yesterday. What was running yesterday is uh, uh, inside is, so the two propellers were made of stainless steel and around it uh, 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 we had, we had uh, a cylinder of soft iron. Okay? No, then. Oh, you know already? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so some, some questions are easy, you know, on, off, and off. <laughs> so, so, it's, it's, uh, and, and, let, and let me what happened yesterday? Today, you said. Yes, that's yesterday. And no field. No. What was for Yeah, that's all right. Let's go back to this picture. Here, that part in the in, in previous experiments when it existed was made of copper. Okay? Then we removed it, it didn't change the threshold much. It actually looked <laughs> Uh, 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 and uh, uh, so this part here has been has been replaced by uh, um, this, uh, soft iron, soft iron. Mm -hmm. and the discs replaced from soft iron to stainless steel. Okay, so it's a magnetic it's it's a it's a magnetic boundary condition on on the other, and, but not in the moving disc. And the and the, the, the answer is no diamond. When I say no dynamo, is no dynamo up to 300 kilowatts, right? Above that. You don't have the result where you have soft iron here as well as on the impellers. In the impellers or behind the impellers? Yes. I, I, I was actually always thinking it's in the impellers. So, the soft iron here and here generates a dynamo, is what I described. In the impellers. Yes. yes. So, what we had is stationary. Uh, see, it's the, it's the converse of that, right? So what we had is <coughs> this made of ordinary copper, the the blades made of ordinary stainless steel, but then a layer of soft iron here. Yes. Okay. No then. It's not the touching thing that matters. It really is moving. It's, it's, it's everything I've, I've been describing today is consistent with the picture I did. Uh, don't you add like a moment of inertia if you have a ferromagnetic material there, something that keeps memory of the dynamo field and helps it, maybe it's an incoherent effect and so you just add up tiny bits and store them in the ferromagnet? No, it's, it's, uh, it's, 
this this one we've got. I think we have it. Uh, you know, I'm going in the wrong direction. So. Um, uh, this this that's the part we understand. There's a first magnetization curve and the second magnetization curve. Once you've gone through the threshold once, you you have a little. How do we say we call it? Remnant field, and that remnant field is biasing the next onset. Okay, that's, that for, for this, I think, we have no other evidence of the effect it has. As for a given torque, the experiments that I've described are operated at constant velocity. So the motors will give the torque that is required to rotate the disk at a given speed. Okay, it's the speed that is fixed. Did I understand correctly that the only azimuthal current is near to uh, impeller? Is what we understand from the <coughs> measurement, yes. Of course, I don't have a current measurement there, but that's what we infer from the measurement. And this current should go through these blades. Yes. The conductivity of soft iron is equal to the conductivity of, of, uh, of um, sodium. Soft iron and sodium have exactly the same conductivity. Electrical. And the most effect is from this. this Plate, rotating plate, but magnetic, but not magnetic blade. Ah, so answer will be given in March. So the next campaign is we'll have rotating disc with iron disc and uh, 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 stainless steel blades, day one. And then we'll be running stainless steel disc and iron blades, day two. My my our understanding is that it is the plane that matters, but it's it's exactly the, same. <laughs> it's the same question we have. Yes. To give us an idea about the preparation time of uh, such an alteration when you replace the iron wall by a soft iron. What uh, time scale should one think of? How long did it take to, to build it? And then what's the actual manpower required at the day of the experiment and the days before? So, preparing we, we run, when we do the experiment, we run comfortably with uh, uh, four people. Okay. Uh, 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 one, so, the typical configuration would be one engineer, uh, 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 two scientist uh, doing stuff and one scientist doing nothing. As we've learned that it's crucially important that somebody doesn't do anything yeah. but watches just about everything. Yeah. All right. We've, we've, uh, we've uh, saved a, a large number of huge mistakes by somebody not being in charge of particularly anything. Uh -huh. In between, uh, the changes of configuration take about two months and usually requires that uh, between six and ten people be involved. Because you got to dismantle. Mm -hmm. Every time we, dis we open up the thing, uh, we need to change all the seals, we need to clean the sodium, we need to get it closed. It's two, it's two months. So our basic turnover is five or six runs, campaigns per year, which is not very much. Ask the same question to Argus. I think it's a little bit more than that, right? That you require a bit more than just four people you normally have at, at the minimum. So remember, I remember more like twelve. But maybe so in Riga, when this thing is running, or even when it is filled with sodium, then always there are three technicians plus. Uh, how many scientists needed? Number of scientists is not fixed and is zero at night. But <laughs> technicians are uh, uh, waiting for all this thing uh, for 24.
24 hours. Oh, so you, you monitor the thing 24 hours from now? So, organization decides that this uh, campaign is approximately one week, and during this week, uh, uh, three technicians uh, in, in shifts are looking uh, after uh, experiment, but uh, measurements are usually only in daytime, or sometimes uh, it, the day is going into evening. And, uh, sometimes even in night, but, uh, and then is the stop in measurements, but the thing is, uh, is uh, staying uh, hot and filled with sodium after, and the uh, three technicians are looking after it. So I see you have only one technician looking after this, yes. and uh, Two scientists are measuring, and uh, the third is overlooking. Yes, so we have one overlooking, two measuring, and most of the time there's, all, there's also four or five scientists that are in the back room trying to figure out what the data mean. In, in, at, in the same time, that is trying to, what, can we learn from what we know to decide what is, what we do morning for, to afternoon, stuff like that. And what is completely different uh, is that uh, we all are st st sitting in some back room, but uh, in this uh, experimental room, no one is allowed to be when the thing is uh, running. You had somebody sitting there? Yes. Yeah. 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 See it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we... Of course, we also have large noise, but because this noise is not so large in this hour, uh, yes. room we, we, are, we are, but uh, in this uh, experimental call, uh, as Axel knows, the noise is enough. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's why we're making shifts. I mean, when, when, when we're there, if, if in the morning you do the measurements, in the afternoon you'd be doing uh, analysis and the other way around, because three or four hours in the noise of the experiment and everything is enough to have you uh, getting bored enough to make a mistake. And they happen quick. Because um, what we do is, is well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to bore you with the details, but one of them is we try to avoid cavitation. Cavitation is a very strong problem in all these flows, so we apply pressure on, on the fluid. So the fluid is operating at five bars of overpressure. Okay? And, and, and well, five bars of pressure plus the rest. You need the two or two and the half bars of yeah, yeah. pressure. But even that is enough. I mean, it's uh, but all the pressure of a few bars is uh, <sighs> it's a challenge. So you are seeing it smaller, and because these 300 kilowatts putting in are rising pressure much more, and all cavitation is proportional to this. Yes. So you can expect cavitation, to prevent cavitation, you need overpressure much higher. Yes. Over. Yes. It actually is very easy to see whether you have cavitation or not. If you have a pressure probe on the wall, the scaling of pressure for homogeneous turbulence is minus seven thirds, as I've shown you. But if you have small bubbles, then the bubbles that go next to the probe act like tracers, and the scaling is commonly then you're measuring velocity instead of measuring pressure, and the scaling is minus five thirds. Hmm. So if you look at if you look at just the spectrum of a pressure probe, you know if you have bubbles in the system or you don't. So that's that's that's. So you also put overpressure then to prevent that. Five bars. Yes. Yes. See. So it was an interpretation that sounds so exciting. I think we should uh, think about it again, discuss it maybe. And I would like to hear Karl Heinz's and other people's comments on that. Maybe that's something for lunch, lunchtime or the next, one of the next few lunches we have. Yeah. Uh, this, I mean, the, the first the report of the Dynamo, which when I heard it, I was very excited, is something which nature doesn't like, right? What do you mean nature? The general nature doesn't like. 
Nature, nature won the paper by saying that uh, uh, well, we already all know that you can make dynamo. <laughs> From all the simulations you mean? Or what? Uh, it, it, it didn't say any more than that. It says it's known that one can grow dynamos. <laughs> yes? But it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you know, it's so. Uh, 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 <laughs> Well, I think I think it's a major accomplishment, and uh, I think for that we ought to applause uh, not just Jean Francois but oh, the uh, entire yes. Caravage yeah, team, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll hear more about this, of course, in the next uh, two lectures by Jean Francois on Friday. Uh, today we have the uh, uh, we continue not in this auditorium, but we go to FB52. So at two o'clock we have Matthias Weinhardt. Uh, talking to us about the test field method. And I think that's all for now. It would be good to um, discuss. Oh, the discussion will be fantastic. Yes. Yes, yes. Hi. Uh, right now I'm just preparing one thing here for Matthias. Yes, but um, yeah, that, that's. I would like to learn more about this presentation. Yes, have you heard from that yet? On the what? On the, uh, uh, on the new theory of the. Yeah, it's, it's a paper will appear in NJT. Uh, uh, and you have a paper on that? Yeah, the first one. Okay. It's not on the web, yeah? Oh, it's on the way. Um, yeah, then I could print it and uh, could give it to my computer. For example, Karl Heinz and Karl Heinz to be. Well, we haven't, so, so it's one. not so. Uh, we haven't written uh, like the, the comprehensive, comprehensive yeah. story that I told you today. What we've written up carefully um, is the measurements in the gallium flow that show that these new effects have to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. Now we're proposing that scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, that part is written up. And, and uh, a comprehensive uh, uh, study is coming up. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could send me also the transparencies of what we have so far. Yeah. Yes, and I could put that on the web if that's okay with you. Yeah. Great. Thank you.